Hey guys, it's Josh here. Uh, this is going to be a super spicy episode where we uh, only talk about realistically one topic, but we're going to touch on a couple things here. But you know, uh, I am, of course, definitely not smart enough to explain to this by myself. Shocker, I know I'm not a genius, I swear. Uh, so I, I pulled in the help of this guy over here, uh, who happens to be, I believe his I believe we call him Big Pod. I don't Hello? know, is that true? Yeah, it is true. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Big Pod, just to let you know, we're on two weeks of this Gen 2 installation. <laughs> good, good. Yep, yep, yep. Well, uh, so far, this is the longest running Gen 2 OpenRC installation that I've had in a while. Because <laughs> yeah. normally, uh, normally, I just install it just to mess around with it, and then uh, I just go and install a more reasonable Gen 2 with SystemD system. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, hey, we're working on it. Uh, also, uh, SystemD is present on my system for some reason. I haven't figured out why. <laughs> but I know that OpenRC is a running init system. <laughs> Good. Yep. Okay. Uh, Big Pod, we are recording this on Monday, July 22nd. Yeah. And yeah. I am mentioning this because uh, people are going to be wondering uh, two things. First of all, why we're so late and why we're wrong. So that's why I'm mentioning the date yes. ahead of time. Uh, now, and the reason why we're mentioning this is because uh, the, basically the entire wor professional world blue screened on Friday. Yeah, I did. Y yeah. Uh, Big Pod, can you give us like a top level explainer as to what happened before we go into detail? <laughs> so on Friday, which was on... 90th uh, one of the bigger an antivirus software or it really isn't actually an antivirus software but let's call it for now uh, CrowdStrike and its kernel driver crashed for Windows based systems so anybody that had their uh, CrowdStrike antivirus uh, would have had problems so now that's, that's why I said it's not really an antivirus. Uh, it's actually an EDR. Endpoint something something. Let, I have notes on this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sad part, and I can't remember. You don't have your notes open on a second. Endpoint screen. detection and release software. There we go. It's basically a fancy antivirus for corporate worlds. And enterprise, of course. Enterprise and corporate. So, basically the difference is this talks with something else on a constant basis. So, the specific product is called CloudStrike Falcon or CloudStrike Falcon EDR. And the point of it is to actually detect some sort of problems and remediate issues if possible. And to do that, it uses, it uses a kernel driver on Windows. Why did it use a kernel driver? Do you know, Josh? Well, I would assume because it's checking the Windows core system files first, just to see if there's like any kind of malicious file or anything in there, or something that just doesn't look right. And to be able to do that, it needs to have uh, at least uh, administrative access to the system. Of which it need, and it also needs to be doing this as early as possible. And what is the very what is one of the very first things that boots when your system boots? It's the kernel. So that's kind of yeah, that but not exactly. The reason EDR software wants to be a kernel also have a kernel driver component is to be as low in the stack as possible, so that anything that is higher in the stack than it, it can attack. Essentially, this is exactly the same reason, and I hate bringing them up, but your anti-cheats want to be a kernel driver. The exactly same reason, because anything that, that runs above it, it can see without a problem. So, any kind, it's because this is actually, unlike uh, some other drivers, it's actually early boot driver. I don't know exactly the actual... Uh, the way Windows calls it, but I believe it's boot start driver. Basically, it's marked so it it will so system cannot boot without this driver. 
which means it's as early as possible with basic kernel components, essentially, from what I understand. I could be wrong, I'm not a kernel developer of any kind. <laughs> but as far as I understand, as early as possible, so yes, it can detect whether kernel has to be tampered with, it can detect whether any kind of drivers, even for NVIDIA, were actually tampered with, and if any of the services and any binaries above that, including your your system, your running system, were tampered with. That's what the point of it all is. And at the time, especially on Friday, we thought that the actual driver itself was porked because everything crashed and everything blue screened with one of three, uh, one of three actual boot that I found that there were three different uh, errors or four actually. IRQL not less or equal, kernel security check failure, system service exception, and page fault in non-paged area. But because it's Windows blue screen of that, Oops, not there's necessarily, an error we're working on solving this issue. <laughs> not necessarily that it actually dead wound off or it could be anyone. Uh, on my host, on my desktop, which is not, there is nothing a virtualization that would be below it, I get hypervisor error blue screen, which from what I understand can only happen in VMs. <laughs> so this gives me gives me credence to the theory that Windows runs in a VM whether you like it or not, if you have Hyper-V enabled. So probably there is a VM, but I don't see it. That Let's say it like that. Yeah, so, uh, and there was a fix, for, they, they quickly found a fix for this as of, uh, within yes. hours, yes. the first few hours, and, uh, the fix is interesting, because, uh, you have to do Microsoft Windows, thing, Windows things, and I know that there's going to be a Microsoft Win Windows admin that's going to understand exactly what I say there, but, uh, so, uh, they, they, they already put a patch in to their repository so yes. you can software update and get it fixed however the you error need to boot for that. Si yeah you need the boot now in order to get the system to boot you would need to get windows to boot into safe mode no which would actu uh, uh, let, let, that's actually incorrect let me correct you there to get oh. it to boot to you get your system to boot you had to do to do the uh, safe booting technically speaking if you reboot it enough times it might actually start the uh, get to the bugged area of the code late enough that it might actually engage the Falcon to do the update by itself because network stack would get enabled by that time when the, it hit the bug. So rebooting, 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 rebooting. Yeah. Now, uh, so... fun fact: to get to the safe mode, you need to at least uh, fail to boot three times. At the fourth time, yeah. then it will go and and check. Okay, you can do boot recovery. At which point and you can go into safe mode, and then you have fun because if you are if you if you are serious enough to have a CrowdStrike EDR, you probably have BitLocker, and now you have a now you have a code you need to type in. First you need to find that code, and try to <laughs> hopefully do you on, wrote it down <laughs> on a fleet. We're not talking yeah. about yeah, like if it happened on my machine, who who cares? I have one bit locker key to input in. That's what twenty five keys. Something that you would know better than me. You probably dealt with bit locker. Uh, I have dealt with bit locker a little bit, and uh, so uh, let me give you guys some context here for this, right? I work at an automotive manufacturer in America. Uh, their Japan, their Japanese manufacturer. When I walked in the work, I had absolutely nothing to do. <laughs> now, bear in mind, I work in recycling, so I'm not necessarily like working in the production line or anything like that. So I just deal with everything that comes from the production line. But the production line is currently not running because all their computers are currently <laughs> blue screen. Yeah, like I, now, I know a lot of companies that, like I know of a company here that basically sent their workforce home. Yeah. Uh, we didn't send our workforce home because they had an active IT staff there. They had, I they had the on-site 
IT staff. Sure, uh, outside IT staff remain, but like the production folks went home. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we had the production IT staff there with a contracting company, with another contracting company, with another contracting company, with another contracting company, with another contract company, with another contract company, because they needed to manually fix over Every 1,400 computers. I heard somebody say that they, that they or read somewhere but it would fit at 30,000 computers. Yes. Now, uh, if you're an IT contractor, you are making money right now. <laughs> yes. You're making money. And you are you know making money. Doing, and and uh, you know what you're doing? You're inputting characters and deleting files. Nothing else. You're just you're you're effectively running pseudo RM this file. <laughs> yes. And you're entering the I believe it's forty eight or fifty something to that huge number of characters key, the, yeah. the recovery key by which you unlock the the bit bit locker for it to actually boot into safe mode. At which point you then go and find the location that is in the in the in the notes for a fix, which is somewhere in the Windows directory, System thirty two believe drivers. Cl- Windows System thirty two drivers CrowdStrike uh, C dash bunch of zeros two ninety one astro stock sys. And then you need to basically run that command in a partial terminal. Remove that file file uh, f- well, file pattern because it's a yeah. file element, so it's a pattern. Anything that starts with C dash zero zero two nine one and end with dot sys, basically. Yeah, lighted. Uh, there was an update to this later in the day, where CrowdStrike released a WinPE rescue image, which is just basically like a rescue drive yes. that you that you can have for Windows, that automatically does this. Yeah, and so I believe it saves Microsoft... you a lot of manual time, and all you have to yes. do is basically just boot it like you would boot an operating system in a live environment. Yes. And so, I believe Microsoft created a tool as well. Yeah, I, I think that they might have collaborated on it. Uh, yeah. Does the WinPE require for you to bit, bit locker unlock it? So you need the uh, uh, so recovery key. From what I'm looking at here, the WinPE image uh, initiates the device TPM if it exists to unlock the disk. Otherwise, okay. you would need to manually enter the key. Okay, so it does the does the right thing, to, so I don't have to enter the yeah fifty character code you you get from the BitLocker as a gift for using yeah. it. Uh, for you Linux guys, the BitLocker code is just basically like if you just have to completely enter a SHA two fifty six hash uh, manually. I'm Essentially, essentially, it is uh, basically it is a, a backup code to your uh, what would Linux use is Lux to. Yeah. It's the backup code to that. Essentially, so when you when you boot into your system, if you have Lux enabled, you have to enter the password or have TPM unlock it for you. Now, if let's say I I need to somehow not not run TPM or I don't know the code, I could have a backup code somewhere printed on some paper, a piece of paper. And this 50 character code is essentially that backup code, which you can enter into your, uh, into the BitLocker boot, pr- during the boot process, BitLocker access, access, <laughs> access asks you for that code. You enter it in very painstakingly because it's 50 characters and then it boots and unlocks your drive. Yep, which hey, that that's pretty cool. Now uh, uh, I heard of course, that apparently some people basically went and uh, made QR codes and used or, and barcodes and and used scanners that turn into uh, keyboard input. Which hey, that that <laughs> is actually a, if you have a compu- stored on a computer, if EDR didn't take it down, uh, the codes yeah that that is like a super easy solution all you have to do is make those qr codes or barcodes and then scanner click done 
uh, you unplug the thing, go to the next one, next code, and somewhere behind you does the deletion of the files. Yeah, now there there is a trick to this too. Uh, a lot of the barcode scanners uh, use user space software to actually initiate yeah. that uh, that connection, especially if like they're 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 the wireless <coughs> ones. Uh, they, they're not using like your typical Bluetooth or yeah. TCP IP protocol. You would need an actual like a the one that is uh, connected by a cable and that acts like a keyboard, like a HID yeah. device that is like full on HID device. Yeah, it, it Which, basically reenacts your keystrokes. Yeah, th those uh, do exist. Now, of course, uh, uh, Linux guys, not necessarily necessary because if you're using something like what is called some sort of uh, uh, either uh, uh, KVM over Ethernet or one of those. Um, uh, IPMI that would be like a lot more useful like uh, IPMI so uh, like yep. ILO IPMI or IDRAC yeah basically IPMI or uh, KVM over Ethernet which is basically kind of basically you have KVM device per I don't know per rack you plug it like normal and then th that just has a freaking Ethernet cable into it and then you have a piece yep. of software on your device and you, on your like on your laptop on your desktop that you exit that KVM with it and then you see all the systems like you were seated yeah. with your own keyboard and mice and monitor right in front of it. Now, of course, uh, this is so. This is not the first time CrowdStrike has done this this year. Yeah, yeah, this is not the first time CrowdStrike yeah. did that. Two because people with a crowd strike. <laughs> yeah, so uh just Windows guys rejoice. Us Linux guys were affected by this too, just not on the same scale. Because yeah. uh CrowdStrike also maintains a Linux client that and basically does a Mac OS as well. Yeah, and Mac OS. And uh it has caused some issues uh before because it turns out that a couple months ago use uh system administrators using Debian and Rocky Linux also experienced some very similar issues. Uh, when speaking of Rocket Linux, I believe that that goes for basically every Red Hat based operating system. Yeah. So anybody, Red Hat, anybody that Red, would, Red yeah. Hat Enterprise Linux, Alma Linux, and anything that spawns from those. Probably even set of stream. Yeah, thankfully uh, it's not nearly as cancerous to fix this on a Linux system compared to yeah. Windows. <laughs> <laughs> that was that I believe that's because of how it was made, because it's actually an EVPF driver, which is... yeah, it's an EVPF driver. But thankfully, when a sys when a system D fails to initiate initiate the boot target uh, boot target, it will it will typically drop you into what's referred to as a re rescue yeah. shell, yeah. Which then you can just fix the system from there. And also, it's important to know that in theory, EVPF shouldn't crash the kernel. In theory, yeah. Of course, it's now. important also to note that if you go to that level, because if it does the kernel panic, yeah, you ain't you ain't getting the uh, recovery shell, and which is, as far as I understand, what it did. It caused a kernel panic, and for uh. for those of you who do not actually know the difference between BSOD and kernel panic, there is none. Kernel panic just Linux version of it. Uh, the blue screen of death is effectively just a kernel panic with a, with a yes. nice fancy message. Fancy message it. that tells you with nothing. Fancy message. <laughs> and on the other hand, you have a kernel panic which gives you a not so fancy message that also tells you nothing. So yeah, it, it just <laughs> throws a lot of text at you. <laughs> I don't know which one is more useless, but one of them is. Yeah. Now. Uh, of course, uh, if seeing nothing else, that, uh, if nothing else, blue screen that looks sadder because that that sad face on it. But th there yep. have been there have been some fantastic recommendations for Microsoft how to how to boost the appeal of blue screen of that. Uh, want to know what was the the biggest recommendation? 
Put an error message on it? <laughs> no. To force every uh, driver manufacturer to include a logo so they can display it on BSOD. <laughs> Brought to you by <laughs> CrowdStrike. <laughs> Basically, p- people had a lot of time because they were figuring out what is happening. So they had a lot of time to put yep. shit on Twitter. Welcome to Twitter. Pardon, yeah, X. Uh, <laughs> it's Twitter, it's not X. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, uh, it's X, formerly Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go that far. So, uh, <clears throat> now, because this has affected affected uh, Linux systems in the past too. This means that uh, Crossrike is not only at fault for this, but uh, they're definitely 100% verified at fault for this. Yeah, it's... Because uh, there is an apparent lack of testing here. Yes. In some some process of delivery between Crossrike and uh, these systems. Yeah. This gives... gives um more apparent credence or credibility to those to those uh, different uh, theories that this could be basically roll out directly from the repo type of deal because yeah, just... this should this kind of a bug should have been caught during testing because while well, you you're doing a kernel driver Installed, installed. Even if, you, even though, despite this, these were side channel files. I don't know if you mentioned it. Maybe I forgot. Basically, these are files, kind of like definitions for your antivirus. You see, you see, uh, pop-ups from anti drive. Uh, the antivirus driver has updated the definition to X. This is basically what it was. Definition. So, what? How the? How viruses look, or how malware looks? What to look for? how to remediate and apparently one of them was bu- filled with mostly almost no, no, no pointers almost because it was about couple couple of i believe it's like about 15 uh, two characters were filled with with yeah there, there was a memory address in there <laughs> memory address but it was so close to null it is basically null for all intents and purposes from what i understand and can still yeah. cause null reference exception, except it's a lot harder to test for than actual null. And that's what caused the problem. So I don't know why didn't they run that definition in their test lab. Because they should have a wide variety of devices, which clearly this wasn't device specific, since everything crashed. <laughs> yeah. This was clearly, clearly, this was wrong. And they didn't have have the code to handle and all. And when they, when they should have put it into the into the lab and restarted those machines because that would have caught it. So either they didn't test it, or that they have a lack of testing procedures. Both of those are scary yeah. for something that builds such an important piece of software, especially security software. Yeah, and uh, if you if you need a face to blame, the CrowdStrike CEO uh, <clears throat> has uh, ran into issues too. Uh, this is George Kurtz is his name. Yes, and uh, he, this isn't the first go around with a mass outage that this guy has been the leader of a, of the company from before. Because this guy used to be the the chief technology officer so that's for McAfee. Yeah, he was the CTO basically, of the Basically, if you do not know C-Suite, he's basically the head of the engineering, head of programming, essentially. Yeah, he's the head brain guy. Yes. <laughs> now, in 2010, they sent out an update that deleted a crucial file from Windows XP system. Yes, it essentially treated Windows XP file that was part of the operating system as a malware. Yeah. So, uh... That one was probably even worse than this one. I wonder... I kind of wonder if this guy implements a development policy similar to, like, what Facebook is. It's just, like, uh, push code, break stuff, fix later. Yeah, but you can do that on a server. You cannot yeah. do that on on a server. 
<laughs> on Servers <laughs> Kernel. Yeah, which, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, executives, uh, whether they have tech experience or not, uh, their job is to satisfy, uh, at the end of the day, for companies like this, shareholders. Yes. But and uh, their job is to this ain't doing push that. sales. Put, yeah, their job is to push sales and make it look like you're actually doing something useful. Yes. Uh, in this case, yeah, uh, it they was were, very useful. They, it's it was it prevented all the devices well, from getting malware. It it, absolute, it prevented the devices from prevention. Now, <laughs> it it prevented devices from getting malware by getting the latest and greatest definitions as soon as they were made available. Yes. <laughs> Which in theory is good. In practice, the problem is that it is running them as a, as part of the driver. And that's that's where the conspiracy theories start. Do you know any of them? <laughs> I, I think I've heard a few by now. <laughs> so, let's leave the whole this was done by, by nation states to to hurt the uh, West and all, all that, all, all those fun theories. Let's go for more technical side of theories. So first of all, Microsoft is to blame. No. And N nope. it, <laughs> it wasn't hurts, Windows update that it hurts in. us very much. We should understand that Microsoft uh, for Windows drivers, they actually have this system called VHQL, which is essentially quality checking for drivers. Again, this wasn't a driver. This was a side channel file that was pulled in by the driver or by the software running on your system for the driver to run. So, Microsoft never did that check, which apparently takes about a week to do. So, if they want to do the update to, to the driver, they have to take a week before Microsoft uh, checks it, see if it's okay, and gives it the stamp of VHQL approval. That didn't happen because, well, it's a side channel file. For this. It's not a side channel. Their, their uh, driver is actually signed. It is. It has VHQL certificate. Problem is, this isn't Microsoft. Something that Microsoft could control <clears throat> because it's side channel files that, that don't act as a driver. That aren't a driver. They, they're literally loaded in by the driver. It's much worse. So VHQL couldn't have prevented that. Second problem, why Microsoft didn't fault. This was never distributed by Windows Update. So Microsoft, even though they, in theory, they, they could have provided a driver, the side channel files didn't go via the normal driver routes. Now the third reason for it is also Microsoft is a distributor. It's kind of like blaming, I don't know, uh, Google Play Store for, uh, or Google for Google Play Store having some sort of bad, bad software on it. Sure, they could have prevented it, but at the end of the day, it is the fault of the guy who made the software. Here, that is CrowdStrike, who shouldn't, who shouldn't have let this update pass. Then, of course, we have theories that this was done to just by CrowdStrike to to stop the IT industry. <laughs> uh, a fun theory that I heard was that there is that uh, just hours before this actually happened, there was a guy that posted on Wall Street bets that <laughs> CrowdStrike was uh, o that CrowdStrike was overvalued, and he started uh, shorting out the stock. Now, if this guy actually did this, he's probably making a lot of money because yeah. Crowd CrowdStrike stocks have. Fallen hard. That that's yeah. the representation now, of their stock. Uh, now the theory is that this guy initiated a botnet to hi to hack into the CrowdStrike uh, repositories and and uh, submit this bug. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, of course, Microsoft gets, still gets blamed for they should have prevented this somehow. Of course. There is also the kind the kind of people who talk about why Microsoft even allows this kind of software to exist, this kind of kernel drivers, and why don't Microsoft disable ability to install kernel drivers? Because So I can touch on that right now. Because uh, people want to do that. Yes. And they are going to pay enough 
to make sure that Microsoft lets them do that. Yeah. <laughs> and let's remember, Microsoft, Microsoft's kernel is a bit different than Linux kernel. It doesn't ship driver for every device with it. It ships what is necessary for it to run. We should remember that. Because yep. that does a lot of difference for us. Why, as users, why? Because we need to load every driver, I, and if we cannot load the drivers, we cannot have GPUs, which means bye bye NVIDIA, bye bye, bye bye AMD, bye bye, I don't yep. know, whatever crazy software we have that we need, we need drivers for, or hardware we have that we need drivers for. Hell, your controller, if it isn't completely compliant, bye bye, because I don't have drivers yep. for it. And no. even that, uh, that uh, before uh, the scanner before, that won't work. Nothing will work. So, uh, of course, there there is a pretty famous uh, Linux guy that uh, said that there's already a solution for for an event like this in Linux systems. Yeah, and uh. Somebody's going to shout POSIX. I know. Somebody's going to shout it. It's going to happen. But System D is here to save the day. Uh, but before we go into that, <laughs> screw POSIX. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Lenart Pottering w uh, issued his opinion. And uh, he's just like... So, and to quote him here. So, if you ask me what my takeaway from the Crash Strike issue is... I'd say boot counting, boot assessment, automatic fallback must be a must for today's systems. Yes. Before you invoke your first kernel, you need to have tracking of boot attempts and a logic for falling back to older versions automatically. It's a major shortcoming that this is not the default behavior for today's distros. And System D has this feature called automatic boot assessment it is actually not completely system d it's actually uh, built upon a, a very specific uh, def a specification that talks about system uh, how to do automatic automatic uh, boot specific boot, uh, boot assessment the bootloader specification uh, which describes how to an annotate bootloader entries with counter that specifies how many attempts should be made to boot it and they have a uh, they have a very specific documentation on how system d implement this schema yeah, and, and they even uh, talk about how to implement it for other bootloaders outside of system d boot which is what system d enables yeah and that that uh, got us uh, wondering down a rabbit hole. It's just like uh, we have these immutable distros where it's just like, hey, they boot up. Uh, if there's something screwed up, you can just reboot them and just pick a previous generation of it. So uh, we we did some like top level digging here into uh, some of these systems. The most famous ones being like Fedora's Silver Blue systems or the what I'm just going to call the atomic desktops or the RPM OS tree images. Yeah. Uh, as well as a uh, Nix OS. I would include like OpenSUSE's micro OS in this, but that works very differently from the others, so I'm yeah. not going to count that one. But, but I believe uh, that one could basically leverage similar ideas as well. Yeah, they're, they're just doing fancy things with ButterFS snapshots. Yeah. But, uh, so RPM OS tree, or well, OS tree itself. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know if this uh, tool works with either, but there's a tool or a utility called Greenboot. Which this is effectively just a effectively just a shell script, and it initiates on the system boot boot complete target, or well, right before that. Right before that, so that yeah, is pr and, very early in the boot process when it comes to actual system D stuff. Before any of the services, early. it's as soon it's it's right after the basic target, and if you actually look at the system D implementation of this. They essentially do the same thing. Yeah. And uh, so, if you want your non-systemd solution, uh, you can install this on on your silver blue, 
on your silver blue or OS3 based image. Yeah, and, uh, main have a target very for this similar... would be probably CoreOS, which is the server version of this. Yeah, CoreOS or like I might even look at it for like the HTPC image that yeah. that I run. Uh, yeah. Maybe experiment with that a little bit because you know uh, that could be pretty cool because I want that to be a just works device, and this yeah. adds to that just works functionality. Yeah, where you know the system will always be able to boot somehow. <laughs> yeah, always boot something, and at that point you probably might want to actually have like a known absolutely works version that like yep. stays like it and could be even months or probably the one that was in first installed automatically pinned to that version. So no matter what, number two will always boot. Number two being or it number three, I don't know. If it starts from zero or start from one, I don't know. Basically there are two automatically and then you have as many as you want pinned. So that would be like the third one in the list, essentially. Yeah. Now, uh, NixOS doesn't do this. Really? No. Uh, NixOS uh, literally just uh, has generation files uh, that are generated and then put into the boot menu. Huh. So there is no there is no automatic fallback on NixOS. Oh. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So if your NixOS image fails to boot. In You're Nixos. manually booting the system through uh, the advanced se settings on your. Uh, boot Would you menu, also sorry. call that an image? Really, what Nixos does is more a configuration more than an image. Well, yeah, it's it's a configuration more of an image, but it saves a boot image file, which yeah. is super minimal. <laughs> Basically, just enough to boot. Yeah, just just enough to boot, and then then it'll just rebuild the system from that generation state. Uh. On that point, at one point we also want to talk about like I have another topic we can pick up one day. I was like, there's so many we already discussed on this show. I <laughs> I spent I don't know a bit of time learning about how boot works, and the reason I learned that is because of the last week's topic of Slovenia and the laptops, how boot works like. There is a lot of bootloaders that happen for one system to boot. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Five, six, seven, eight. Shim, nine. Yeah, maybe maybe we should uh have have like a breakdown of like the 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 a system boot process because I yeah. think it's actually different for operating system platforms as well. And it's different per per architecture of CPU. Yep. We should remember that that X eighty six is actually pretty nice. Because X eighty six oh, is pretty nice because you know it just supports everything. <laughs> yes, and it has a in the default is a CPI. So there's no, a standard. No device trees. I hate device trees. I don't know who yeah. thought of that idea. I know uh, who thought I of it, I don't know why they thought of it, but it's not for laptops and desktops. Qualcomm, remember that. Yeah, something to do with a Raspberry Pi using the GPU to initiate boot. Yeah, that's also a fun one. Yeah. All right, so uh, Big Pod, I appreciate the conversation, and uh, you know, uh, I know that uh you you did a lot more research into this issue than i did and as a result i would like to be able to help compensate you for that <laughs> but i also know that running this podcast actually does cost money as well we're not using a free platform to host no nope. we're actually paying money to, uh to get this to you yeah uh because you know i want control over this podcast i don't want to have to deal with like you know youtube coming in saying that hey we're removing this from uh, from uh your, your uh rss feed because we don't like what you said here i don't want to deal with spotify's dynamically inserted advertisements yes or youtube so, going uh, i couldn't just code that so f you which which this is gonna give a little attention uh for you youtube bots everybody else can just uh, tune out for about a minute 
So if you if you notice that there are some episodes missing, maybe you checked out our RSS feed and there weren't some episodes on YouTube, that's because YouTube decided to not transcode them and because I am lazy, didn't check and now I noticed. So I am fixing that and they're gonna appear someday. Someday. So uh, that said, YouTube I don't algorithm take... like me. <laughs> Yeah, I don't take the YouTube platform seriously. Otherwise, uh, we would... Uh, uh, fix that thankful- a lot sooner. And so, our one source of truth for all of the content for the show is the audio RSS feed. That is the source of co- that is the source of truth because that is what we directly control. Show.taxbase.com Yep. Now, we're, we still don't have an implemented funding model, but we're still taking feedback for this yes. as well. So, and uh, if there is no feedback soon, we, we're going to implement something. And it's probably going to be really sad and horrible because, well, we're not exactly creative in that department. So please contribute yeah. something good. Or at least contribute. At least give us an idea because, you know, uh, I can spin up a Patreon page. In fact, I have one. All I have to do is just hit a go button and it's basically set up and configured. And I can make Castopod do premium RSS feed. And then yeah. I can make bigger files. B- and force him to do bigger bitrate. But yeah. what's the point if it's just that? And no. Patreon. We want something a bit more that you will also enjoy and get something in return from us. Some value. And I don't right. know and, uh, if bigger bitrate is really the value you would want unless you are audiophile. But I at mean, that point I already know that I already know that we publish at a higher quality of audio than some podcasts. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like our editing might not be nearly as clean or professional <laughs> as them, but you know, we have a higher bitrate, so uh, we're doing good there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, anyways, editing uh, is by someone really professional. <laughs> Yeah, if you would like to uh, give give us feedback on that, we have an email address. Uh, it is contact at tuxbase.com. And if you want to reach out to us directly, we have these links here. Uh, Big Mine Pot, is your link actually working? Still it still doesn't, doesn't work? work? Okay, so you uh, can just shout at me. But, you know, Big Pot is there anyway. Hopefully, by the time this episode hits, it will work. Maybe by the time next episode hits. If, I've if been, all else fails, you... I've been doing going slow, slow to get everything to a perfect state, so that I never have to do it again. Yeah, so uh, the those links are there. I guess you can just shout at me for now if you, if uh, Big Pod still isn't working. Uh, or it, come, I know to, or come to the Disco channel. We're yeah, also you, there, we even, and you can shout at me all you want, yeah. and I won't right, even notice. Right, we have... Yeah, we have a Discord. We could just set up like a simple URL redirect. That way we th- that way we can make it super easy to type. Just do like tuxpace.com slash discord. We can just yeah. point to fi- we can just uh, point the I could do that in Nginx that. real quick. To take yeah. me what, five minutes to do that. Yeah, so uh we can we can set that up, make it super easy to uh get it, get into the Discord community, which uh it's super small. And uh the most active people in there is me and Big Pot talking in an internal chat channel. Yes, but hey, uh, that's a place to come and hang out because you know uh, I'm certain that uh, it, I want to see what like what kind of community uh, we can have here because uh, every every of the communities that I have in like my own personal projects, which I guess you can count this show as one of them, uh, has an amazing community with it too, and uh, they're still small. There's it's still small scale. So uh, it hasn't grown or, or anything like that. I actually think that I got my first moderator on my own Discord server for, for, for not that long ago. But hey, uh, I want to I, I want to see, see like the active feedback from everybody that we yes. possibly can. You can even leave us feedback in the Discord server too. But hey, you know and what? For those of you who, who comment on YouTube, please do more. I might actually read it one day. <laughs> I, I've read uh, the last few uh, that over the comments there was no like direct feedback except yeah audio levels we know but we're, we're trying to get those right the professional level editing that we have 
tries. How it succeeds? Well, if there is a mistake in anything, blame me. I'm yeah, the editor. But, uh, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, and thanks for doing that, Big Pod, because uh, I'd just be posting raw files. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyways, guys, uh, that's it for the show today. Uh, we will see you next week.